Greetings, everyone. Um, this quarter, I've been teaching a course called Holocaust is Public Memory. And one of my students said a few days ago, well, we really need to preserve the diaries and biographies of leading Nazis, and that too should be part of Holocaust memory and memorials. And I was very taken aback and I thought about it. And as I've read David Morrow's excellent, wonderful book, um, it's come back over and over again, that comment. The key dilemma here, I think, is whether we should be humanizing or demonizing uh, Nazis, either leaders or, or followers. So if we understand better how the Holocaust happened by studying the perpetrators, um, will that help us um, prevent future genocides? That's at least the hope. Now, this book has had an enthusiastic um, uh, reception. Uh, what's exciting about it is that he proceeds to destroy several myths and it's a good read, myths about, and he can talk about these, I'm sure he will, his childhood, uh, the atrocities in the Ukraine when he was in the Waffen-SS, um, whether he applied to work at Auschwitz, um, his supervisor, uh, Ver Scheuer, uh, who worked at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, um, the twin research is obviously of tremendous interest um, and why he was recognized so often um, by survivors, uh, as, as the key figure on the ramp. Um, so I wanna just ask four questions for us to think about. I know that um, David may answer some of them and some of them may remain. Uh, if he was so proud of his work, uh, why did he run and hide? Uh, if he was not raised as an ardent anti-Semite, why did he volunteer, it seems, to work at Auschwitz in this leading position as a physician? Um, should his boss, Ver Scheuer, who's not in the SS as far as I can see, be considered complicit in the crimes? Um, and then had he been captured by the Mossad, um, would his capture have been as important as Eichmann's was um, uh, for so many, in so many ways. So uh, David Marwell has his PhD from SUNY Binghamton um, and uh, wrote a great dissertation on Putzi Hafspengel, who was a friend of Hitler's, a really fascinating topic. He's had a string of amazing appointments, assistant director of the US Holocaust Museum, a director of the Berlin Document Center, uh, um, uh, the chief investigative research of the US Department of Justice, especially important for sources he used for the Mengele book, um, and very dear to my heart also, so uh, president of the Leo Beck Institute, uh, New York, Berlin. So with great pleasure, I introduce um, our speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Deborah, for that very thoughtful uh, introduction. And uh, I hope to address some of the questions you asked. And, and uh, uh, if not, then uh, people can re-ask them during the Q&A period. Um, Joseph Mengele is best known for his activities at Auschwitz, at the Auschwitz concentration camp. He took up his duties there exactly 78 years ago this week on May 31st, 1943. My book chronicles Mengele's life and career, and I will summarize both in a few minutes, but it is important to know that my book is not only about what Mengele did, it's also about what people thought or fantasized that he did. By the time Mengele went bathing in the ocean on what was to be his last day on earth, one month before his 68th birthday in February, 1979, when he suffered a stroke and drowned, he had already emerged as a larger than life symbol, a process of what one might call iconification began after Mengele's service at Auschwitz. And aided by his representations in popular culture, you all remember Gregory Peck from Boys of from Brazil. Mengele became a figure in many popular films and novels and plays. That process of iconification continues today, long after his death. Indeed, he has become for some an outsized character who represents not only the Holocaust, but also the failure of justice at the end of World War II, which saw so many Nazi criminals escape any kind of reckoning. He is also regarded as the exemplar for science gone mad. When I started work on my book about five years ago, I set up a Google alert so that I would be notified each time Mengele was mentioned on the internet. And since then, I have received messages nearly every day, and on most days, multiple indications that Mengele's name had been invoked sometimes as a historical figure but just as often as a benchmark for evil, as a malign metaphor. 
Since the COVID pandemic, those mentions of Mengele have increased significantly as issues of medical ethics have emerged and as people have sought the right means to express anger, fear, or describe evil behavior. Here's the front page of a uh, Greek newspaper which compares Mengele to Albert Bur Burla, who is the Jewish CEO of Pfizer. I think today I received eight or 10 uh, Google alerts that Mengele was mentioned somewhere. The more Mengele has become a symbol, however, the more obscure he has become as a human being, as a man. My book strips away at the myth that has attached itself to Mengele and that has served to elevate him to his iconic role. And at the same time, it hopes to replace that frightening caricature of a monster with an even more unsettling picture of the human being that he was. Beginning in 1980, I served as a historian for the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Special Investigations, where I conducted research in support of U.S. prosecutions of Nazi war criminals living in the United States. This badge, as dramatic as it, as it seems, uh, was really for, for commemorative purposes. We didn't really carry it for identification. We had one of those flip badges that the, you see on, on TV. Um, and, but this is one of my, my most prized possessions even today. In 1985, I was assigned to the investigation of Joseph Mengele with the goal of discovering if and how he might have been used and assisted by the United States after the war, and finally to find him and to bring him to justice. The investigation was soon joined by two and then three international partners with the Israelis and the Germans coming on board in early 1985 and the Brazilians in the summer of 1985 after a body thought to be that of Joseph Mengele was discovered in Sao Paulo, Brazil. In the course of the investigation, I visited Mengele's hometown and his hideouts. I read his private correspondence and intimate musings. I interviewed his family, friends, colleagues, victims, and in the end, I held his bones in my hands. I originally set out to write about my experience with this investigation, a kind of memoir in a sense, but in the end, I changed my plans. Instead of restricting myself to writing solely about the investigation, I expanded my effort into a biography of the man himself. I had discovered a rich body of newly released records and brilliant scholarship, both of which shed light on areas of Mengele's life and career that had been unknown to me and which became available only after I started writing. My book is based on records which I found in archives in Germany, Israel, and the United States, and some also in South America. I used the once top secret CIA file on Mengele, which was released and declassified in the year 2000, and the secret Mossad report declassified and released only in 2017, after I had finished, nearly finished, the first draft of the book. It is based on interviews with participants and on my own recollection of events in which I participated. It is also based on Mengele's own writings. Here's a picture of the notebooks and diaries and uh, writing efforts that Mengele was engaged in that were discovered after his death. And notably, it is based on an autobiographical project that Mengele had begun in the early 1960s and continued to write through the 1970s, early 1970s. He decided to write the story of his life for his family, not as a strict memoir or autobiography, but rather as a novel, believing that if he were freed from the bounds of literal truth, he could use literary devices to make certain points about his life and to apply it to a wider range of of life situations. He believed that his life in some way had important lessons for his family and uh, so he wrote a, a, a novel that was based on the facts of his life. Now you can imagine as a historian and as an investigator for the Justice Department how complicated this source uh, was for us because it was admittedly fiction but it was based on fact and the effort was to try to tease out what was true and where he had embroidered or had um, distorted the truth. 
And I believe I was able to do that. And in the book, I tell uh, one of the key stories about how I was able to use his autobiographical novel to discover very important uh, issues about his post-war whereabouts. I begin the book by describing Mengele's childhood. And I admit to finding no hint there of the man that Mengele was later to become. He was, the bo he was born as the first of three sons into a prosperous and prominent family in the Bavarian town of Gunzburg, where his father owned a farm, farm machinery manufacturing company and which became the major economic force and major employer in the town of Gunzburg. The family had status and Mengele was welcomed into a warm and supporting home. There are no stories of Mengele having exhibited any signs of the extreme behavior that was later to characterize his activities. No torturing of pets in the backyard and no, no sign of extreme, of extreme politics that were to, to uh, animate his life later. Catholic and conservative were the words used to describe the family by family friends. I describe Mengele's education he was a middling student in, in uh, secondary school, in what we would call high school, uh, but he was on an academic track. Um, he was quite ill as a, as a young person and uh, did you know, reasonably well, but was not, was not a star in the classroom. The inspiration uh, for his later life really came when he went to the university, which he began in the summer term, which begin, begins in Germany in April of 1930. I described this elite education, the inspirational teaching that he received from Nobel Prize laureates, those who had already received the Nobel Prize and those who would later uh, receive it in their career. His decision to study, I talk about his decision to study medicine and anthropology. He earned PhDs in both of these fields. He not only earned his medical degree, meaning that he could practice medicine, but he earned an advanced degree in medicine, which allowed him then to have an academic career to be a professor or to lead an, an institute or a laboratory. Here's the, the um, matriculation card from the University of Munich, which details his academic career. He studied at the University of Munich, at the University of Bonn, at the University of Vienna, and later at the University of Leipzig. Very common for German academics at that time to, to go to study at different universities within the German system. This is a picture of him when he started uh, in April of 1930. This is Mengele as a young student with some of his colleagues. Here he is with his white lab coat with another student colleague. Here he is having fun with one of the faculty here, a nurse uh, in the institute in Frankfurt where he was an assistant, and another photograph of him. Mengele was a, was a very promising student. He published in respected journals. Mengele's medical dissertation on cleft palates was cited as late as the early 1970s in a medical journal. He published book reviews. He published notes in journals. He had all of the promise of becoming uh, a significant contributor to German scientist science as it was understood at the time. This is a photograph from the meeting of what became the Physical Anthropology Society in 1937 at Tübingen University. And you'll see right in the center, Mengele's uh, mentors, uh, Atmar von Fischur, uh, Theodor Mollison, who was his mentor in anthropology at the University of Munich, uh, Eugen Fischer, and other important leaders of the field. And was as was appropriate for his status at the time, Mengele is over here on the margins. But he's a part of an elite group, and he's in the context of, of a science that, that captured his imagination and his talent. I summarize Mengele's career as a student uh, in my book in the following way, and I'm quoting now from the book. The years of Mengele's university study changed him just as profoundly 
as they changed both his country and the status of the science that had become his consuming passion. He entered university in 1930 at a time of political uncertainty. The impact of the Great Depression had not yet been fully felt in Germany. He emerged eight years later in the vanguard of a new science and committed to a new political vision, both of which promised to change Germany and the world. The combination of his studies in medicine and anthropology provided Mengele with a perfect scientific complement to Nazi politics. Indeed, it was Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy, who said that Nazism was applied biology. Through medicine, with its focus on the human body and emphasis on genetic pathology, and through anthropology, with its focus on the racial body, the racial community, and emphasis on the qualitative differences between races, Mengele had equipped himself to be a frontline soldier in the struggle that was at the heart of Nazi ideology and that defined its politics. I explain how the role of the physician underwent, underwent a transformation under the Nazis, where the so-called racial community, the Volksgemeinschaft, was substituted for the individual as the focus of care. Nazi physicians could, in an intellectual and moral sleight of hand, remain faithful to their Hippocratic oaths and engage in Nazi racial and eugenic activity simply by substituting the perceived welfare of the people, of this racial collective, for that of the individual patient. And I quote now from a, a scholar who wrote about this phenomenon at the time. The physician must abandon his old humanitarian conceptions. He has one patient, the German people. The individual is no more than a single cell of the whole body. The people are transcendent. They are the only body. It is this popular body which must be preserved and treated. To maintain it intact, no sacrifice is too great. Just as a doctor will not hesitate to amputate a finger to save a limb or a limb to save a life, so the Nazi physician is prepared to undertake all aggression against the individual who menaces the people, against individual Germans with an even greater reason against strangers. And that one should also apply to against Jews and others who are considered inferior. After his studies, Mengele joins the army when the war begins in 1939. And I supply a very important corrective to past biographies of Mengele by explaining that his wartime experience as a frontline soldier with the SS Viking Division saw him exposed to combat and extreme violence from the very beginning of the invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941 until the retreat from Stalingrad 18 months later. Here's Mengele in uniform as an Obersturmfuhrer or a first lieutenant. This was taken when he was on leave at home in the summer of 1942. Another photograph of Mengele on the, on the Eastern Front in Ukraine in October of 1942. Most books who talk about Mengele's career have him leaving the Viking division sometime early in the summer of 1942. In fact, he remained um, until uh, January of 1943 when he was evacuated from the retreat from Stalingrad uh, in January and returned to Berlin. The unit that Mengele was in was, was involved in uh, a number of mass shootings right after the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, killing uh, tens of thousands of people, probably. Um, we don't know whether Mengele was involved in these mass shootings, but we certainly know that he knew about them and that they contributed to the environment and context of, of extreme violence that accompanied him for the 18 months that he was uh, on the front lines of the German uh, war against the Soviet Union. I devote an entire part of my book to Mengele's time at Auschwitz. I think the section on Auschwitz makes a significant contribution. I won't go into terribly much detail here, but for anyone who thinks they know what Mengele was doing at Auschwitz, especially if they cannot read German and know little about recent scholarship on this subject, the book will surprise them. First, a lot of myths about Mengele. Many people believe that he was the only physician at Auschwitz. He was one of between 15 and 20 or even perhaps a few more physicians who were assigned to the camp. He had specific duties that did not involve murder 
or um, experimentation, but involved uh, a kind of public health function at the camp, which was to, not to protect the inmates of the camp, but rather to protect the German staff and German citizens who, who, were, who surrounded the camp. Um, this took the form mostly of the combating of, of epidemics, which because of the conditions of the camp uh, were a, a huge danger. And Mengele instituted a number of, of very rash and, and one could say grotesque methods of clearing out epidemics uh, as soon as they began by emptying out entire barracks of, of prisoners and sending them to their deaths. Um, one of the problems about understanding Mengele's role at Auschwitz is that we simply don't know all that much about it based on documentary sources. There is a, there are a, pos, is a paucity of records surviving about Mengele's work at Auschwitz. We must rely on the testimony of witnesses, and this testimony by its very nature is difficult in many cases to rely on completely. The witnesses who talk about what he did very often were not in a position to understand the full context of his, of his work. Um, they can speak authoritatively about what happened to them, but it's difficult for them to speak authoritatively about what Mengele's purpose was in the experiments that he was conducting there. But certainly in terms of criminality, um, on whatever scale you want to use, Mengele's major crime at Auschwitz was his conducting of selections on the ramp at Auschwitz. Trains from all over Europe would deposit their passengers who, who boarded from all corners of Europe on the ramp at Auschwitz. First, the ramp was located outside of the camp of Birkenau, and then later uh, in the spring of 1944, a, a rail spur, which you can see here in the, in the photograph, was built into the camp so that prisoners could be released directly into the camp. And Mengele managed the process along with other physicians at the camp. This was a, a, a duty that was assigned to physicians because it was considered in, in a way a kind of also a public health function. He was to separate those prisoners who would be sent directly to the gas chambers and those who would be exploited first for their labor and for other talents that they might have had before they would be killed. So the selection was the, the incoming prisoners first experience with the camp and among the first people that they would have encountered was the physician who was carrying out the so-called selection. Um, he would divide the, the incoming prisoners who would approach him in a line. He would send some to one side and others to the other side. Um, able-bodied men and able-bodied women who did not have children would be used for labor. And they were sent to the camp and registered in the camp and got the tattoo and sent to a barracks. Old people, children, and mothers with children and anyone who appeared infirm would be sent directly to the gas chambers. It would not have been registered in the camp and would have been sent uh, either by foot later on when the spur was located in the camp and before that by truck uh, to the gas chambers. Mengele carried out this duty not every day. He did it on a routine basis. There was a, 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 a um, schedule that was posted and he did his, his uh, his share of, of these selections. He was not only selecting people who were to die and those who would be exploited first, he also used this process of selection to further his own scientific interests, most of which were conducted on his own time. Um, Mengele established at the camp a kind of research institute patterned on the one that he had been associated with in Frankfurt and later in Berlin. Um, he kept up a direct contact with his former colleagues in Berlin and his mentor, Atmar van Verschur, and he used his work at Auschwitz both to further the work of the Institute in Berlin, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology, and also to further his own ambitions. In Germany, after you get your PhD, if you want to have an academic career, you have to do a postdoctoral dissertation called the Habilitationsschrift. And Mengele almost certainly was using his research at Auschwitz to um, further his own uh, 
ambitions in terms of uh, writing the uh, making his habilitation. How do you set up an institute? Well, you need colleagues. And what Mengele did is he sought among the prisoners who arrived, he sought those who would be able to assist him in his scientific research. He looked for anthropologists, he looked for physicians, he looked for medical illustrators, he looked for medical technicians, he looked for nurses, he looked for all of those people who could assist him in not only conducting research but also recording it and um, keeping the files accurately and also uh, caring for it to the extent they were cared for, the subjects of his experiments. He also sought subjects for his experiments among the arriving prisoners. Mengele was quite interested in twin research. This was not because he had a grotesque interest in twins, but because twin research was considered the gold standard of, of genetic research at the time. Uh, more than 200 dissertations were based on twin research uh, and written in Germany during the period of the Third Reich. Twin research was conducted not only in Germany, but also in the United States and in Great Britain, and some of Mengele's research or the research done at his institute was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. The problem with twin research is you need twin pairs. You need both, both parts of a twin pair, and most of the time, twin pairs uh, that remain together, uh, they remain together as children, but not as adults. And so most of the experiments on, on, on twins were done with children. When the war started, the supply of twins basically dried up within German cities. Uh, certainly as the war progressed, children were removed to the, to the countryside to uh, protect them from allied uh, air strikes. And um, it became difficult and expensive to be able to carry on a, a substantive uh, twin research protocol. But at Auschwitz, where Mengele, when he was there, perhaps 750,000 people arrived. If you think about the natural occurrence of twins is between one and 2% of the population, you can do the math and figure that thousands of pairs of twins arrived at Auschwitz. And Mengele had a, a nearly unlimited supply of subjects for his twin experiments. I won't go into a great deal of detail here, but I will tell you that most people, if you ask them what was Mengele trying to do with twins at, Mengele, at uh, Auschwitz, they would say he was trying to discover the secret of twin birth because he wanted to increase the German birth rate and was interested in, in um, using it to you know, further populate German, Germany with Aryan people at a, at a much quicker rate. If you think about it, this doesn't make a great deal of sense, and it wasn't true. Mengele's interest in twins was, as I said, part of his interest in genetics and using twins both identical twins and fraternal twins was the, the accepted method for, do, for, for research on twins. If you, if you think if he was interested in discovering the secret of twin births, he would have been interested in the parents of twins and not necessarily on twins themselves. And of course, he showed very little interest in the parents of twins. Um, so Mengele assembled this research institute he had uh, almost an unlimited supply of twins. He had a rich group of inmate physicians and other technicians who had little choice but to work with him. And in the course of his time at Auschwitz, he was interested in um, probably, f I, in the book I, I detailed six areas of scientific interest. We don't know exactly what experiments he, he did, but we know that he um, carried out a series of experiments um, in the area of twins, which is which was normally kind of uh, uh, interested in pathology and in, in disease. If both members of an identical twin pair have the same disease um, and both members of a fraternal twin pair do not in any great uh, numbers, then you could posit that the that the pathology was related to to uh, genetics and not to environment and vice versa. And that was essentially the, the program for twin research. The other areas he was interested in are, was, were uh, eye color, not because he was interested in changing the color of people's eyes by injecting blue dye into them, but because he was interested in the mechanics of eye color and the chemistry of eye color. So he did put drops into um, uh, subjects' eyes, which was painful and alarming, 
but he did not attempt to change their eye color through the injection of dye, which is one of the myths that is often mentioned about Mengele. He was interested in, um, in something called specific proteins, which was a complicated story. He was interested in trying to find a cure for the disease of Noma and a number of other things. Uh, another overarching interest of his was in growth anomalies. He, he was interested in, in dwarfs, dwarfism, and gigantism, and would um, harvest the, the bodies of incoming uh, prisoners who had these conditions, and then their skeletons were, were used for, uh, for um, research. He was also interested in the gypsy population, so-called gypsy population, um, likely uh, because of his anthropology training and was, according to one witness, uh, writing a book about the um, variety of, of uh, Roma and Zinti families and clans and their physical attributes. This is a picture of Mengele at the camp. He's now a Hauptsturmführer or a captain. He's here with the high level commandant of the camp. Another picture of him. I conclude my section about Auschwitz in my book in the following way. The notion of Mengele as unhinged, driven by demons, indulging grotesque and sadistic impulses should be replaced by something perhaps even more unsettling. Mengele was in fact in the scientific vanguard enjoying the confidence and mentorship of the leaders in his field. The science he pursued in Auschwitz, to the extent that we can reconstruct it, was not anomalous, but rather consistent with research carried on by others in what was considered to be the scientific establishment. It was criminal and monstrous because of the absence of all barriers that ordinarily serve to contain and regulate the temptations and ambitions that can push scientific research across ethical boundaries. To relegate Mengele and his research to the ranks of the anomalous and bizarre is perhaps more palatable than understanding that he was the product and promise of a much larger system of thought and practice. It is easier to dismiss an individual monster than to recognize the monstrous that can emerge from otherwise respected and enshrined institutions. Mengele left Auschwitz in January of 1945. He, uh, the, the Soviets arrived on, on January 27th. Mengele, with the rest of the guard force, left around uh, a week before, around the 17th or 18th of January. Mengele left. He went to Berlin, slightly north of Berlin, to meet with the boss, the chief of all concentration camp physicians. And we received another... Um, assignment to be the chief physician at the um, camp out near Breslau, Gross Rosen. By the time he arrived at Gross Rosen, it was about to be overrun by the Soviets, and he went to a subcamp of Gross Rosen. By the end of the war, by May of 1945, Mengele was on foot walking back to Germany when he came upon a Wehrmacht, a regular German army field hospital, was able to join that field hospital. Um, because he knew one of the, the physicians in there. He shed his incriminating SS uniform and became uh, a member of the, considered to be a member of the staff of the hospital. And he and his fellows went into a kind of an encampment in the forest that was stuck between the advancing Red Army and the advancing Western Allies. And he was there for about six weeks. This was an area called the No Man's Land. When the war stopped, the front lines of both the Eastern and Western Allies froze, and there were some German soldiers who were caught in this no man land in between. This gave Mengele time to get to know his colleagues there, develop a very cogent cover story. But by the middle of June, he decided wisely with his colleagues that it was better to surrender to the Americans rather than to the Soviets. They got in their vehicles, they drove over, and were taken prisoner by the Americans near Hof in Bavaria. And he was in two American POW camps, and was released in August of 1945, likely under his own name. You will ask me, how could he be released? Wasn't he the most wanted criminal, war criminal uh, around? The answer is he was wanted. He certainly wasn't the most notorious person in, in 1945. Um, his name was on some wanted list, but we discovered in the course of our investigation that the wanted lists, although they were printed, and his name appeared on them, they weren't distributed 
some of which didn't re arrive at POW enclosures until uh, December of 1945. So the people who were releasing people from the concentration camp, from the, sorry, from the POW camps, had no idea that he was wanted. He also didn't have the Waffen-SS blood type tattoo under his left arm, which was the practice for all members of the Waffen-SS. As the medical officer in his unit, he was in charge of making sure that everyone had the tattoo. He was able to avoid this so that when Americans were releasing German prisoners, they had them take off their shirts and raise their hands. If they had the blood type tattoo under their left arm, they would be shunted aside, selected in a way, and interrogated more harshly. If you didn't have it, then you were just released. And Mengele was released. He went and worked on a farm as a common laborer for about three years. And eventually in 1949, he made his way with his family's help to South America. He got a, this document from the International Red Cross. I mentioned before the family was wealthy. They were able to um, supply him with um, all of the necessary funds that, that were needed to bribe and bribe people and to hire, hire guides to make, help him through the Brenner Pass from Austria into Italy and then made his way to Genoa where he boarded a ship for Argentina. He arrived there in 1949 in the summer and for the first time in many years for him, he was able to, in a way, um, relax. He wasn't involved in the kind of heavy manual labor that characterized his time on the farm. He was in a cosmopolitan city that had bookstores and libraries and theaters and movie houses. He could revisit the life of the mind. He could uh, um, associate with the German emigre community. And it was a very benign environment, not the reason, the reason being that the, the, the uh, strong man in Argentina, Juan Perón, welcomed Nazi fugitives. And he had a kind of uh, a supportive environment in which to live and work. And he worked. He started a, a small machine shop, uh, uh, represented his family's mach farm machinery business, um, and eventually invested in a pharmaceutical company where he was the, the chief scientific officer. He was so comfortable that um, he decided he would go back and visit Europe, which he did in 1956. Uh, when he returned from Europe, he decided that he would um, although he was living under a false name in Argentina, the name Ar Helmut Greger, he decided to retake his own identity. He went to the German embassy in Buenos Aires and told them that he had been living under a false name. He got a German passport. He decided to marry. He got married to his brother's widow and was married in Uruguay in the summer of 1958. And just around the time he got married, uh, his family in the, in the Bavarian town learned that the German police were beginning to show interest in Mengele. They came to the town and asked where he was, uh, did he survive the war, where was he? And they got word to, to Mengele in Argentina, and he decided that he couldn't stay there anymore because Argentina had a extradition treaty with Germany, and if they asked for his extradition, there was no guarantee he wouldn't be extradited. So Mengele went to Paraguay where if you became a citizen, you could not be extradited. And Mengele, through, through fraud, was able to get a, a Paraguayan citizenship in May of 1959. And he began to build a life there under the name of Jose Mengele, citizen of Paraguay. In, in May of 1960, the Israelis captured Adolf Eichmann in Argentina, and everything changed. Mengele knew that he couldn't be extradited from from. Paraguay, but he could be kidnapped by the Israelis. So that represented a significant change in Mengele's life. He decided he had to go underground. He had to take on another assumed name, and he had to find his way uh, to another country. And he found his way to Brazil, where he lived, um, always afraid that the Israelis would capture him. Um, and they almost did. And I tell that story in the book. Um, how the Israelis got very, very close to him. But in fact, he died a frightened, hiding man, living in a, a way that no one imagined, uh, in a kind of a lousy house in a poor suburb of Sao Paulo. Um, when in February of 1979, he 
went to the beach and drowned. So I, I've left out the whole story about the search for him. I hope it, if you're interested in that, um, we can talk about that in the Q&A, but I think I've used up my allotted time and I apologize for doing that. I'm gonna stop the share and come back. Okay, thank you so much, David, for a fascinating uh, presentation. And I haven't read the book yet, but I definitely want to now. Uh, we have a number of questions and we will take more, but I will begin with a question by Lou. What did Mengele actually do to the prisoners that was so monstrous? I thought that was a fascinating question. I, I can tell you, um, we know what, what witnesses say he did and um, which was to, there are, there are stories of him, you know, doing uh, surgeries without anesthetic and, um, and things like that. Um, but I have to say that in terms of actually understanding what he did precisely, we, we really don't know. We know that um, part of the investigation of twins, part of twin research, the first stage of that is to determine whether twins are identical twins or whether they're fraternal twins, whether they have the same genetic makeup or whether they have um, the same genetic makeup that siblings have, which is they might share as much as 50% of the genetic, but, that, but fraternal twins have the same uh, environmental history. Um, so the first thing they do, and it, you might think it's, well, it's easy to tell the difference between a fraternal twin and a, and a an identical twin. Well, it, it wasn't in, in, in 1944. It's still so occasionally not so easy today, but with DNA, of course, it's much, much easier. In 1944, they had to do a, a kind of painstaking research, a comparison of similarities between the twins. And this involved taking plaster casts of, of their teeth and comparing those um, measuring all kinds of kind of anthropometric values, uh, you know, the circumference of the head and the length of the, the nose and the, how broad the nose is. A lot of uh, blood taking to determine blood factors and blood groups, um, fingerprints and footprints. So if you look at the twin testimony, much of it talks about that kind of preliminary investigation of whether twins are identical or fraternal. We don't have the testimony of the twins who died, so we don't know what happened to them, but we know many, many died. Um, but we, but for those who survived, if you read the testimony carefully, much of it deals with this initial sorting out of, of whether twins are identical or whether they're fraternal. Um, we know that he took, you know, that he used these unwilling subjects for uh, taking their blood, for doing comparisons of their blood. Um, we know that he, um, and there's witness testimony that, that he would have children who had growth anomalies uh, murdered and then have their, through the autopsy, have uh, uh, samples of their bodies take, sent to Berlin for, to the Institute. We know that in the eye color uh, experiments that he would have the eyes harvested from experimental subjects for, for uh, examination, you know, in the laboratory. Um, but all of this is is um, difficult to be absolutely precise about. What's monstrous about it, in addition to the individual um, harm that he did, is th this um, the, the basic notion that the people whom whom he was experimenting on had no standing as human beings and no rights as human beings. It, it surprises many to know that German practice and German uh, legislation um, before the war had tremendous uh, uh, protections for uh, subjects of experiments. It's very difficult for Germans to do experiments on living subjects. Um, and that's why many German physicians would experiment on themselves. But Jews didn't count. So, and if there's a lesson to be learned from the book, it, it really is in a sense that these these boundaries that Mengele routinely disregarded, um, that we have to be careful about that today, especially with the powerful means we have now for research. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions about that um, fascinating autobiographical novel that you mentioned. I was actually um, wondering about that too. So Cassian is asking uh, whether you can tell us, or if you can tell us more about this, this piece of literature and whether it's available. And Odette um, is wondering whether there are any signs of remorse in the autobiographical novel. Well, so we have, we have, we, we, I know about the autobiographical novel because, I mean, I discovered it first because I, I read through the correspondence that Mengele carried on with his son, who was living in Germany. And he described to his son this project that he'd undertaken. And he describes, you know, why he chose to write it as a novel and the advantages he thought it offered. Um, and he talks about the process of writing it and even some of the some of the progress he was making. You know, he says, well, I, I finished the section when I, what, what he called the, the farm period, when he was living as a laborer on the farm. And then he describes in great detail his exit from Germany. He does not talk about Auschwitz in the autobiographical novel that we were able to locate. It is possible that he, he actually did something about it, but that, the, that it uh, was withheld from the family or that it was destroyed by the family before his death or that he destroyed it. Um, the, it is a very long-winded piece of work. He spends about 100 pages. These aren't full typewritten pages, but 100 notebook pages describing his birth where he you would think it was one of the great events in, in you know, in the Western world at the time. Um, and we learned a lot about his education through his kind of talking about his professors and talking about his interest and talking about science. He doesn't show any remorse whatsoever, either in the autobiogra autobiography, which is incomplete, or in his correspondence, or in what is for me, a kind of very dramatic encounter that he has with his son right at the end of his life, when his son, who grew up not knowing that Mengele was his father, believing that Mengele was, was uh, a, an uncle who lived in South America, uh, later discovering that he was his father when Mengele went to visit Europe in, in 1956, when, when Rolf was a, a young 12-year-old. Uh, um, and then Mengele's mother, who had divorced, I mean, sorry, Rolf Mengele, the son's mother, Mengele's wife, divorced him before he went to South America. And she raised the son with her new husband. And so Rolf Mengele, the son, grew up in the 1960s in Germany as a uh, kind of a lefty uh, alternative, you know, long hair, uh, studied to be a lawyer, uh, progressive politics. And he carried on a long correspondence with his father, which he did not like. He felt he was forced to do it. And Rolf Mengele had in his own mind an understanding and appreciation, I believe, for his father's crimes. But at the same time, he was terribly conflicted, as you imagine anyone might be, uh, this kind of biological connection and this complicated sense of being attracted to and being repelled by. And Mengele's uh, ability to kind of write around things in their correspondence, where he wouldn't answer a question directly, he would, he would kind of deflect it. Rolf thought he had to meet his father in person. So he decides that he's going to go to South America, go to Brazil, and confront his father. And he plans it out very carefully. He swipes the passport from a friend of his who looks like him. He makes his way to South America. It's all very well documented in correspondence between Mengele and the son and Mengele and other members of the family. And he, f through lots of kind of operational security, different taxi cabs and changing uh, cabs, he, find, he makes his way to Mengele's, uh, where Mengele is staying. And eventually he confronts him. And uh, he, I talk about this and I have from, from Rolf Mengele, uh, a description of what what the encounter was like and I'll just quote from it here he's saying from his point of view from his father's point of view he is not personally responsible for the incidents there at Auschwitz he didn't invent Auschwitz it already existed he couldn't help anyone on the platform for instance what was he to do when the half dead and infected people arrived it was beyond imagination to describe the circumstances there 
His job was to clarify only able to work, unable to work. He was able to grade people. He had tried to grade people able to work as often as possible. He thinks he saved the lives of thousands of people in that way. He hasn't ordered extermination. He is not responsible. Also, the twins owe their lives to him. He has never harmed anybody personally. This is what Mengele told his son during this very tense encounter. Rolf described his father as getting very excited, angry, even crying, asking whether I, his son, believe, his, believe in lies told in the newspapers. And at that point, the father kind of breaks down and the entire conf confrontation ends. And Mengele, the son, believes there's no real possibility for him to get any clear answers from his father. And the father understands that his son has been kind of, um, his mind has been polluted by, you know, by the post-war world and has, he has no appreciation of what his father did. And then in perhaps the last, nearly the last act of his life, he writes to the son, Mengele writes to Rolf um, a few months before he dies and says, uh, now that I've met you in person and been able to look at you and see you, I can feel more comfortable about dying. There's, there's no one on earth who, who cares more about, her, he didn't say heredity, about heritage and about environment than I do as a, as a scientist in this area. And so my meeting you was very important for me, to for me to understand. And I realized that there's very little I could do beyond um, uh, certain things to, to influence your life positively. And I understand that you can't really appreciate what I did in my life. And I won't justify myself. I've already explained in the objective way, I hope I did what I did, but, um, but I won't justify myself any further. And then he says, my patience has a limit and that limit extends to the point where my family is harmed in any way, or there is a threat to my racial community, to my Volksgemeinschaft, which is this very Nazi concept. It's a kind of sentence that he might've uttered in 1944. And it shows that this kind of red thread of this concept ran through his life and that he died kind of unrepentant uh, and believing in what he did. Okay. Um, I was actually, while you were talking about Mengele's childhood, I was reminded of a trip I once took that was decades ago to Günzburg. And this must have been in the late 70s, early 80s. And there was still... Uh, the Mengele company or whatever it is, the name was still there, uh, visible. I don't know when you were last there. And I remember how shocked I was seeing this sign. Uh, apparently the Mengele's of Günzburg, they didn't, or whoever owned the factory or company, didn't see the need to change the name. And that um, leads me to a question by Allison. Uh, did the Germans actually devote... Uh, resources to finding and prosecuting Mengele? Well, at least to finding him first. Yes, they did. I mean, it, it was a, um, it was a, a, a kind of lackluster effort, but also a very difficult effort. I mean, the time to find Mengele was between 1945 and 1949 when he left Germany. And at that time, Germany didn't exist. They were occupied by the Allies, and it was really the Allies' responsibility. And really, in the interest of justice, it would have been, it would have served justice in the way justice should be served if he had he been found and prosecuted, uh, probably at the doctor's trial at Nuremberg in, in 1947, 46. Um, he but that didn't happen. The Germans, you know, for, for the, with, with the beginning of the Cold War, the Germans um, made very little effort throughout the 1950s to, to, um, to try to uh, have any kind of accounting for, for Nazi crimes. Uh, it wasn't until the very end of the, the 1950s, in 1959, when the first major trial, the so-called Einsatzgruppen case, uh, w was held in Ulm, which is not far from from Mengele's home. Um, and then, of course, you had a, a, a great acceleration in those efforts with the Auschwitz trial in 1963, and then um, uh, several decades of much more um, robust effort to, to find Nazi criminals living in Germany. Um, the Germans, in terms of investigating after 
in terms of police efforts to find him, they would respond, respond to allegations that Mengele was seen here or seen there. And there's a lot of, I mean, I went through all of the police files. There's a, there are a lot of indications that they, you know, they would stake out when Mengele's father died, they staked out the funeral. When, Meng, when Rolf got married in Munich, they staked out the, the wedding, they had photo mm -hmm. surveillance of it. Um, but one could question whether, uh, you know, whether there was, um, at the highest levels, the political will to, to have done that more effectively. But you have to also realize how difficult it would be to, to do that, especially in a country that had, uh, you know, the rule of law, where you couldn't just you couldn't just eavesdrop on someone's phone. You had to get a court order to do that, and there were so many people you had to listen to. There's so many people whose mail you had to you had to intercept. Um, it, be, it became a difficult issue in 1985 when we started the investigation with the Justice Department, and when the, we joined with the Germans and the Israelis. The Germans were quite active in that. Of course, Mengele was already dead, but they, they were mm -hmm. active, and it was their efforts that actually discovered that he had died in, in Brazil. The, their search of, of a Mengele family friend, they discovered the, the documents that led them to to uh, to, uh, to Sao Paulo and led me to Sao Paulo. Right. Uh, thank you so much, David. Uh, it was a real pleasure, and uh, I'm sure there's so much more in your book. And I have questions for you, but we are running out of time. So I... if people want to go on, if you go on my uh, website, davidgmarwell.com, there's a place to, to send me questions and I'd be glad to receive them. davidgmarwell.com. Okay, thank you. So now uh, I would like everybody um, to stay on just for a couple more minutes. I invite uh, Eric Mitchell, the university librarian, to join me. Hi, Suzanne, thanks so much. And uh, thank you, David, for such an interesting and insightful uh, discussion tonight. Uh, I think your presentation is a, a really great and fitting conclusion to this year's series of events. Uh, although the Holocaust Living History Workshop was founded to promote connections between local Holocaust survivors in the community, uh, the study of the Holocaust clearly includes uh, this other side of the grim story of uh, the perpetrators. And, uh, I think in this regard, it's, it's really hard to think of a more disturbing figure uh, than Dr. Mengele. So thank you uh, for uh, bringing him uh, here this evening. As we're wrapping up the season, I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank everyone who's participated in the workshops this year. Uh, first and foremost, our sincere gratitude goes to our generous sponsors, Lorraine Ratner, Phyllis and Daniel Epstein, and of course, uh, Goody Shock, God, Judy Gottschalk. Uh, it's also my pleasure to acknowledge the endowment established in honor of Lou Dunst. Uh, we truly couldn't offer the high quality programming without your sustaining support, so thank you. We are also so happy that the workshop has withstood Zoom fatigue and virtual event overload this year. Uh, in fact, we've actually been able to expand our audience uh, in the past year, and a really a heartfelt thanks to each of you for joining us virtually uh, throughout our throughout our series. So, with that, I think all that remains for now is for me to wish each and every one of you a healthy and relaxing summer. Uh, thank you so much, and good night. <laughs>